Genesis chapter 22. We'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they, both of, uh, so they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of, the, of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing, the good testimonies. Thank you for being a good God that neither slumbers nor sleeps. Lord, you're always looking out for us. Lord, long before we know there's a problem, you've already got the solution. God, we thank you for watching over us. Now, Father, we thank you for this evening that you have blessed us with to be able to come to the house of God. God, I know it's raining outside. And I know that uh, many of your people have worked hard today, this week, and Lord, these old bodies get worn out in the flesh, but God, we're thankful for that. We have this refuge on Wednesday night where we can come and we can hear songs of Zion and we can open the perfect law of liberty and Lord, uh, taste from the bread of life and hear of God. God, we're thankful for these thy people. And God, I pray that you'd bless them abundantly tonight. Now, Father, you know what we stand in need of. And I pray you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, and God, I pray the word of God would not fall on deaf ears, but we would not only become hearers of the word of God, uh, but doers of the word of God. Uh, now, Father, I pray that, Lord, you'd help each and every one of your children tonight, uh, those that are watching my live stream. And God, I pray that you'd get glory and honor to your name. Uh, Father, be with those that are sick and those that are providentially hindered, those that are traveling. Uh, God, for the next few minutes, put a hedge about us. Uh, and God, open our minds and enlighten our minds to thy truth. Uh, use this unworthy vessel and glorify your name. We'll thank you for it, uh, for it's in the holy and wonderful and glorious name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we do pray, amen and amen. I want you to notice a couple things as a way of introduction. Uh, uh, we find that uh, Abraham is often referred to as the father uh, of the faith. Uh, can I say that you and I that are saved by grace through faith tonight, uh, we received all the promises of Abraham uh, because it's always been a faith way. Uh, 
When you believe what the Lord says and act upon it, uh, you know, the Lord uh, uh, certainly does a work in your life. Uh, and we find that Abraham uh, in this chapter uh, is the model uh, of living by faith. Uh, notice a few things, if you will. Notice, first of all, uh, the relationship uh, in faith. Uh, again, in verse number 1, it said it came to pass uh, after these things that God did tempt Abraham uh, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. Uh, 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 here I am. Uh, what a blessing uh, to see there's a relationship. Uh, God speaks to Abraham. Uh, Abraham hears God. Uh, Abraham speaks to God. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, aren't you glad the night you got born again, uh, uh, you got washed uh, 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 in the blood of Christ and your sins were cleansed. Uh, how you were robed in the righteousness of Christ, uh, justified by faith. Uh, you were indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, and now you're in a relationship uh, with the very one who formed you in the womb uh, of your mother. Uh, what a blessing. We speak to him in prayer. Uh, and he speaks to us through the word of God. Uh, I'm glad that uh, he's my father. A uh, little bit... Uh, uh, farther on down, Isaac says, my father. He says, uh, here am I, my, my son. Uh, what a blessing. We just say, my, our father, and he just uh, speaks. And yeah, what do you need today? Uh, we see the relationship in faith. Uh, notice the resignation in faith. Look in verse number 3. The Bible says, uh, in verse 2, the Lord tells him, take his son, his only son. I'll address that in a minute. But we find here in verse 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, rose up, went to the place which God had told him. Can I say that God speaks to him, says, I want you to go and take your son, uh, and I want you to offer him for a burnt offering to me. And then the next morning, Abraham did it. He got up and did what God said. Now, what resignation in faith? He didn't say, well, let me think about this. He didn't say, well, you know what? I love that boy so much. Uh, uh, I think I'll be like uh, Jonah who's coming after me. I think I'll go in the opposite direction. No. God told him what to do, and he was resigned to do what God said. You know why we don't have revival in this land? It's not for lack of preaching. There's more and better preaching today than there's ever been in America. It's because we don't do what God says. We see a resignation in faith. I want you to notice the reverence and faith. Look in five, verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. I don't know about you. God's blessed me with three children. He's never asked me to ever offer up one of them on an altar. He offered up his son on the cross for you and I. But I, I can imagine, though, Brother Josh, if God said, slay one of you youngins, the last thing that'd be on my mind would be worship. But yet, Abraham had so much faith that he even reverenced God, knowing what's about to happen some of you had a bad day on the job today and you couldn't even come out and worship tonight you're here but you got the pooch mouth some of you are faced with some uncertainty in the days ahead and you're not you didn't even come to worship Abraham knows he's going to slay his son and then he's going to burn his son and then uh, he's going to trust God to raise his son again and in the midst of all that, he says, by the way, we're going to go worship. Mm -mm. We see reverence in faith. Now notice the resolution of faith. Look again at verse 5. He says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Now look what he says, and come again to you. Now did not God tell him to go slay your son and offer him as a burnt offering? Does not Abraham have the wood, the fire, and the knife? And he said, we're going to go worship, and then we're coming back. Mm -hmm. He said, come again to you. Mm -hmm. 
Romans chapter 4, Paul gives us some insight. Verse number 20, talking about Abraham, he says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Does not the Bible say without faith it's impossible to please God? Can I say that Abraham knew he was coming back with Isaac because God had already promised him that in Isaac all the nations would be blessed. He just believed what God said. You know why you don't have any victory in your life? You don't believe what God says. Mm -mm. He staggered not at the promise of God in unbelief. Yet, he glorified God in his faith. It ought to be every Christian's desire to glorify God. How do you do that, preacher? Walking by faith. Hmm. See, we live in a got to see it world. Seeing is believing, they say. Mm -mm. The hand is quicker than the eye. Seeing is not believing. Believing is when you can't see a way. And you just trust God to make the way. Because God said that's what would happen. Huh? Well, I'm not there yet. Hang with me. Notice the reliance in faith. Look at verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and here's this verse I like, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. <laughs> when have you ever called on God that he didn't have time for you? Huh? Mm -mm. Uh, there's a whole lot of preaching right there, but I'm not going to, I, I, I can't get bogged down tonight. I've got a lot, a lot to cover. And Abraham goes on and says, and he said, or uh, uh, Isaac says this, and he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, can, let me just do a little sidebar right here. Abraham had raised that boy right. That boy knew you couldn't worship without offering a lamb. Mm, mm, uh, hey, it does matter raising your children right to know what worship is. Hmm? All right, that's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, but look at what verse 8 says. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. So they both went. Uh, so, so they went, both of them, together. Notice the reliance in faith. Abraham, when he said what he said, didn't know what he was saying. He didn't realize that God himself would become a lamb one day. But he did. Mm -mm. But he's relying on God to send the lamb. Hmm? It's reliance in faith. And then I want you to see real faith. Verse number 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there. By the way, this is the four. There, Abraham built four altars. There's eight altars in the book of Genesis. Abraham visited four of them. This one was one that he had to have built with a broken heart. Abraham built an altar there and he laid the wood in order and he bound Isaac his son and he laid him on the altar upon the wood and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son make no mistake Abraham wasn't looking around behind him Abraham purposed in his heart he was going to slay his son because that's what God told him to do then he was going to burn his son because that's what God told him to do. Because Abraham believed God. Abraham believed that if he burnt his son, God would raise, the, uh, raise him back up out of the ashes, and he was coming back with him. Listen to what Hebrews eleven nineteen 19 says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, and from whence also he received him in a figure. Can I say that was real faith? Hmm. Boy, God help us to have real faith. We talk a lot about faith. Yeah, you know, I was preaching nine years before I'd ever started pastoring, and I'd preached a lot about faith. But you talk, Brother Ray and, and Miss Pam, some of them was there in the early days. I learned a lot about faith when I went down there at Victory. When you go from making you know, a six-figure income to $150 a week, you're going to learn a whole lot about faith. But there's something I can tell you about faith. It's real. And the real question is, do we have real faith? God has not lied 
to anybody and he's not slack concerning his promises the slackness falls on us I'm not there yet hang with me notice the rewarding of faith verses 11 through 14 I won't read them the Lord matter of fact it says the angel of the Lord you know that's Christ manifested in the Old Testament the Lord speaks to him from heaven says Abraham Abraham and just like in verse number one it says yep I know that voice he said don't do any harm to your son don't lay hand on him he said now I know that you love us me more than even your son next thing you know there's a ram caught in the thicket right behind him huh Mary that ram might have been there the whole time but he didn't make a noise till it was right on time huh can I say God's always got the answer all the time he's got the solution and it's usually sent long before you ever know there's a problem our problem is we just got to learn to depend on God he rewarded his faith now everybody loves that song brother James sings I know brother James was out of the will of God when he didn't sing it tonight when I lay my Isaac down don't you love that song that's one of Miss Nett's favorite songs when I lay my Isaac down we love that song boy they'll start, she'll start striking the keys on the piano some of you already start coming to the altar huh? because you love the words of that song when you lay your Isaac down when I lay my Isaac down you know what happens there's a culmination of joy of victory of peace of satisfaction you'll get a zeal for God that you haven't had for a while you get assurance you'll find boldness when you lay your Isaac down and you'll find a love for others that you didn't have till you laid your Isaac down we love hearing about when we lay our Isaac down but tonight there's a reason you don't have victory and boldness and a zeal for God and a love for God I announced we was having camp meeting you should kick the walls out There's a reason that song's not real in your life tonight. There's a reason when they sing that song and you come to the altar and you go back and you sit down, you still don't have joy and you don't have victory and you don't have assurance and you don't have peace and you don't have boldness with God and you don't have those things that you should have when you lay your Isaac down. Go with me to chapter number 15. We're about to get there. I want you to see what leads up to chapter 22. We like starting at chapter 22. Chapter 22 is the final picture. You've got to see what gets us to chapter 22. Look at chapter number 15. Look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, Abraham, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And here's what Abraham did to what God said. And he believed in the Lord. And he, the Lord, counted it to him, Abraham, for righteousness. Now look in chapter 16. Now, the Lord tells Abraham, it's not your nephew Lot, it's not your family. You're going to have an heir. And he's going to be as the stars in the sky. He's going to be blessed above measure. Now look at chapter 16. Look at verse number 1. Now, now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bear him no children. And she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my, hand, my maid, that it, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. It's not the first time a man listened to a woman in the Bible and messed up, by the way. Anyway, uh, just talk to Adam listening to Eve. But anyway, huh? 
And Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So we see that Abram and Sarah begin to take matters in their own hands. Look at verse 15. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. Now look in chapter 17. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. Uh, it's about time some of you got caught up in your Bible reading anyway. All right? Chapter 17, look at verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. Boy, can you imagine laughing at God? Abraham did. And said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Now, you remember chapter 22 when God told Abraham to take his only son? Now, did we not read where he's got a son named Ishmael? And now God's promised him a son named Isaac? Turn to chapter 21. In chapter 17, Abraham asked God to make Ishmael the blessed and promised son. And God said, no, Sarah's going to have a boy, and you're going to name him Isaac. Look in chapter 21, verse number 1. And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said. Told you he never, he never breaks a promise. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bared Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whose Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Now look down in verse number 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread, and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed, and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Notice that Sarah says, I'm not going to have her and that boy in our house to be heir with Isaac. And it became grievous unto Abraham. And God speaks to Abraham, and says, don't be grievous, son. He said, do what your wife said to do, because in Isaac shall thy seed be blessed. Uh, he was the promised son, not Ishmael. We find that word grievous. It burdened 
and grieved the heart of Abraham to do what he was about to do. We find in verse number 14 that he gets up and he sends Hagar and the boy away. And that boy becomes dead to Abraham. God looks at him as dead to Abraham. God didn't tell him to go take Hagar, the bondman, uh, bondwoman, uh, uh, to be wife uh, and to bear a child, uh, but that's what he did. Uh, and he became uh, a detriment uh, to the work of God. Uh, and we find that he put Ishmael uh, and Hagar away. Uh, and my dear friends, uh, that's why uh, all the uh, 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 nations in the Middle East hate Israel. Uh, uh, because Israel's the promised seed. Uh, hey, uh, Ishmael was the firstborn, uh, but he didn't get the blessing. Uh, he didn't get the heirship. Uh, hey, uh, he's always felt it slighted. Uh, that's why those men, uh, 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 those lion-like men of the Middle East uh, are always in contention with Israel uh, because Abraham took matter in his own hands. Now this is what I want to get to. A lot of prep work tonight, I understand. I said, the reason some of you, you'll hear that song. You try to lay your Isaac down. Because the Lord don't want your Isaac, He wants you. And you, you, you don't have any victory. You don't have any joy. You don't have any assurance. You don't have any peace. Uh, you don't have any boldness. Uh, all those rewards of God and uh, touch from God you ought to have in your life. Uh, and you say, I've tried to lay my Isaac down. I've tried to do what God wants me to do. I've tried to put God first. I've tried to give him me. Uh, but it just doesn't seem to work in my life. Here's what I'll preach on. Before you can lay your Isaac down, you've got to let your Ishmael go. Before you can lay your Isaac down, you've got to let your Ishmael go. You don't have victory tonight because you're trying to deal with Isaac, but you've never dealt with Ishmael. You've never let Ishmael go. And Ishmael is hurting your chances of laying Isaac. You can't lay Isaac down as long as Ishmael's hanging around. Can I say this? Had Abraham not put Ishmael away, Chapter 22 never came about. He could have never, ever offered Isaac unless he'd have dealt with Ishmael. And I say tonight, you've got an Ishmael hanging around. That's why you don't have victory. That's why you're not on fire for God. That's why you're not the soul winner you ought to be. You're not the light you ought to be. You're not the, the salt you ought to be. You, you don't have the testimony you ought to have. Testimony. Why you don't have victory? There are things that are uh, uh, running your life, uh, 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 and you've not got victory over them. There are things uh, uh, that hinder your walk with God, uh, that hinder your walk of faith. It's because Ishmael's hanging around. Our Ishmael just might be one of these things. Can I say your Ishmael or my Ishmael? might be the sin that besets us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1 says, Wherefore, seeing also we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, uh, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Uh, 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 you can't deal with Isaac because that Ishmael's hanging around. Might be the sin that so easily besets you. Uh, uh, can I say this tonight? Uh, uh, the devil doesn't mess with most of us. Uh, 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 he don't have to uh, uh, because we've got little pet things uh, uh, that gets us off track, uh, uh, that gets us off over in the ditch. Uh, 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 those little things uh, that beset us uh, and keep us from walking uh, the walk of faith uh, and friends uh, that very sin uh, that so easily besets you uh, is robbing you of your victory and joy tonight uh, it stole your shout uh, it stole your st uh, spring in your step uh, uh, because that sin constantly is hanging around your neck uh, say so what sin you talking about brother Doug your sin my sin that one that just seems to be there. That one that when I bring it up, when I'm preaching, you say, oh, there he goes again meddling. Some of you are right now cringing, hoping I don't bring it up right now. Well, I don't have to. You already know what it is. Some of you won't make it to your car to that sin's already got you beset. You'll never get to Isaac because that Ishmael has control of you. 
I remind you, Abraham had to put Ishmael away. God didn't take Ishmael from him. And can I say tonight, you'll never get victory and never get to a place where you can lay your Isaac down until you deal with your Ishmael. God's not going to take it. You've got to let it go. Can I say, it might be that sin that besets us. Can I say, it might not be the sin that besets us. Our Ishmael might be the society that beckons us. I would to God that people that claim to be saved would as, as involved in churches as they are in the world. It amazes me how much they know about the world and how little they know about the Bible. It amazes me how much they'll talk to folks in the world and how little they'll talk to God. Mm -mm. It amazes me how excited they get in events in the world and they come to church and they're sitting there dead in a hammer. Because that's it. that Ishmael's controlling you. I remind you, the Bible says in 1 John 2, 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Your Ishmael's keeping you from victory tonight. You wonder why you come to church and other folks are shouting and having a time and joining them and folks are getting some help and you sit there and week after week after week you don't get any help. It might be that society that's beckoning you. You're so concerned about pleasing somebody in the world and you're not concerned about pleasing God. That might be your Ishmael. You'll never get to Isaac till you let Ishmael go. Hmm? I got to thinking about this. Our Ishmael might be Satan that bullies us. Hmm? I've told you a billion times, all you got to do is resist the devil. He'll flee from you. And the best way to resist him, just hang out with, with the Lord. The wolf never goes after the sheep that's closest to the shepherd. The Satan won't bully you if you hang out with the Lord. Every time the Satan shows up, just jump in the lap of the Lord. He'll leave you alone. But the reason you're dealing with the devil so much is you're walking awful close to the ditch he wants to trip you up in. Hmm. Yeah. I worry about people all the time talking about, well, the devil's doing this to me, and the devil made me do this, and the devil... Well, first of all, most of the time it's your rotten flesh, and isn't the devil. Well, why are you hanging out with the devil anyway? I thought you were saved. You know, I got went over there and read about that bad man in Gadara. Had a, had a, he, his name was Legion, and he said he had as many as a thousand demons inside of him. I can't imagine having one, let alone a thousand but when he met Jesus, they found him clothed in his right mind. You never see him hanging out with the devils anymore. Matter of fact, he went and told the whole town, hey, next time Jesus comes to you, hey, he'll help you too. And the next time Jesus did come, the whole town was there waiting on him. Huh? So why are you all the time hanging out with the devil? Might be your Ishmael. Hmm. Thought about this. Our Ishmael may be the subject's or persons that belittle us. Listen, I do not want to minimize abuse or bullying. They can be horrible things. If you've been raised in an atmosphere where you're told you're no good every day of your life, when you become an adult, it's hard to come to the fathom that you can become good. You can amount to something. You've been in an abusive relationship where somebody tells you that no one else will love you and somebody hurts you on a constant basis and you put up with it because you think nobody else will love you and then you come to find out that Jesus loves you and other people will love you. It's hard to overcome all of that. If somebody tells you you're ugly every day of your life, you're going to feel ugly. I understand those are very, very real and traumatic situations. But can I say this? Too many of us use the terms for excuses. Because somebody looks at us cross-eyed don't mean we're bullied. You talk to somebody that's really been bullied. Just because somebody doesn't agree with you does not mean that you are hated. Talk to people who have, because of the 
color their skins or their ideologies have truly been hated you'll find out you haven't been hated at all but there are people that will belittle you that will look down on you that will not agree with you and if you're not careful you'll let that become your Ishmael hmm? listen I don't know why God has enlarged my coast and I'm blessed to preach where all the places I preach and go the places I go but you want you want to know something that gets under my crawl real quick is a preacher that gets up and thinks that he's better than everybody in the building and he better hope I'm not preaching after him because I'll let him know that he's not none of us are worth the powder to take to blow away it's only by the grace of God we're saved uh, you, know, you understand that uh -uh. why God ever left heaven to go to Calvary for any of us I'll never know none of us are better than anybody but was, there are some people who will look at you in disdain because of the way you dress the way you look where you go to church if you're not careful you'll let that jack you up that might be your Ishmael I don't know why but God bless me with too much confidence and I really don't care what anybody thinks of me for serving Jesus but there are some people I know that impacts them that might be your Ishmael Hmm. you got to let Ishmael go I had learned a long time ago I'm not going to make everybody happy living for Jesus I'm not going to make everybody happy preaching the word of God there are some people that have left because they don't like the message that I preached and I'd like to say that doesn't bother me it does bother me matter of fact I beat myself up a lot should I said something this way or that way or what way but you know I, I've come to realize God made me the way he made me and I'm just me and I appreciate you all coming and hanging out every now and then you know I, I, just, I, just, I still don't know why you come back week after week but I'm sure glad you do be a bad echo in here without you but if you're not careful you'll get consumed with what everybody else thinks and that my dear friend may be your Ishmael then I thought about this your Ishmael my Ishmael might be, might be the self that bemoans, bemoans us if you're not careful self will control you self will counteract everything God wants to do your flesh is rotten my flesh is rotten if we're not careful our ego will get in the way and we'll want to be self-governed instead of governed by the word of God and the spirit of God and ourselves may be our Ishmael because ourselves tends to think more highly of itself than it should and God help us we ought to always be humble thinking about the goodness of God towards us let me say this I'll be done I've been long tonight I know I'd be long tonight I've tried to stay in point when most people think of Ishmael they think of the flesh Egypt's always a type of the world Ishmael's generally a type of the flesh he was from e Egypt his mother was but Ishmael's more than just a type of the flesh Ishmael represents something a whole lot more and it's what keeps us from laying our Isaac down Ishmael represents doubt in our life There's too many people in this day and age doubt the will of God for their life doubt whether or not God's speaking to them doubt whether or not they're where they should be with God doubt whether or not they're even saved you do realize doubt is a tool of the devil because every moment you're doubting you're not fulfilling the, the, the word of God the word of God says that anything that is not of faith is sin and so if you are full of doubt you are not living and walking by faith therefore you are in sin and while you're in sin you cannot have the peace of God the victory of God the blessings of God nor can you be the witness for God that you should be 
Ishmael represents doubt in our life. Ishmael represents disobedience in our life. When God speaks and we don't do it, we're disobedient. We're rebellious. And the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And when we have rebellion and disobedience in our life, we cannot have the peace of God. We cannot have the victory of the Lord. We cannot be all that we can be for Christ because Ishmael's in the way. And then can I say this? Ishmael represents disdain for the things of God in our life. You say, preacher, we come to church. We don't disdain the things of God. Well, we disdain the things of God when we don't do what God says to do. And I say there are people that go to places called churches all across the planet who are trying to merit God's favor. People come to church because they think that's what they're supposed to do. I don't come to church because I'm supposed to. I come to church because I get to. Mm -mm. I don't deserve to get to come to God's house, but I get to come to God's house. But we have disdain when God tells us to do something and we don't do it. Mm -hmm. When the preacher calls for a fast and we don't fast. When God lays it on the preacher's heart to call for revival and we don't come to revival. When the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together and yet if it's convenient we come to church but if something else comes up we miss church. That's a disdain for the things of God. God said don't miss. But when we do, and I'm not talking about when you're sick, I'm not talking about when you're providentially hindered. I'm talking about when you let something else become more important than the house of God. Mm, friend, don't complain if the next time you have a tragic event in your life and God finds something else more important than to deal with your tragic event. We have disdain. When God puts it on the preacher's heart to deal with how much time we spend in front of a screen instead of in the Word of God, and you go right home and turn on the screen and don't open your Bible. You have disdain. See, disdain is saying, no, God, I know better than you, and I'll do it my way. That's Ishmael, friends. That's putting this above God. And you'll never be able to lay your Isaac down until you let Ishmael go. Too many of you are carrying Ishmael with you all the time. And then you come to church and you hear Brother James sing that wonderful song. And you flock to the, uh, to the altar trying to lay Isaac down. And you can't lay Isaac down because Ishmael's right there in your ear. And when you get back in your car, you have no more victory, no more joy. You're not any closer to God than you was before the service started. One of the greatest indictments of our church age is that after we leave the house of God, we look no different leaving than we did coming. What church ought to do in our lives... We ought to come and get filled up so that when we leave, we can go empty ourselves on this lost and dying world and let folks know that Jesus is coming and let folks know that the Bible's true and let them know they're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire unless they accept the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior and then come back to the house of God and get filled again so we can go get empty again. But unfortunately, what our churches have become is nothing more than glorified self-help seminars where we've got to learn to deal with life. I've got good news for you. Here's how you deal with life. Get in the Bible. Get on your knees. Start seeking Jesus. Uh, and everything else will take care of itself. But yet we let Ishmael control us. 
but we never have victory, never have joy, never have peace, never have satisfaction. I'm trying to quit, but I can't. Let me help you. Your lost loved ones will stay lost as long as you let Ishmael control you. You want to see satisfaction and see him saved? Get rid of Ishmael. Then you can lay Isaac down. And then business will pick up. But Clint, your lost loved ones are never going to come through that door till you get rid of Ishmael. Those unspoken prayer requests, those co-workers, those family members that are breaking your heart because they're not in the house of God tonight, those prayers that you have offered to God for years will never be satisfied until you get rid of Ishmael. Then you can lay Isaac down. And then business picks up, friends. All the tracts we've given out, all the preaching tapes, all the people we've invited, we'll never see the harvest of souls being saved that I'd love to see get saved. And you'd love to get saved till we get rid of Ishmael. Because when we get rid of Ishmael, then our relationship with God is free and clear. And then God will direct us what Isaac's we got to lay down. And then God will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. But until we get rid of Ishmael, we'll never ever see the victory and the joy and the hope and the peace and the assurance, the satisfaction the folks getting saved, revival breaking out, all the things we talk such a good game about, we'll never see it come to fruition until we get rid of Ishmael. So tonight the message is clear. I hope you can get rid of Isaac, but first you've got to deal with Ishmael. Tonight, why don't you go ahead and ask God, God, what's my Ishmael? God, show me and then give me the grace to let it go. And let God do a work in your life tonight that we can see God do a work with our Isaacs in the days to come. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While they're coming and picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, I know it was a heavy message, but a needed message. Lord, a lot of times we get the cart before the horse. A lot of times we want to deal with things on our terms and not on your terms. So I pray you'd help us, Lord. Show us our Ishmaels and give us the grace and the help to let them go. And then God, speak to us in the days to come about what we can do to prove our faith and our love and devotion to you. Now, Father, speak to hearts in this invitation. Now, there may be somebody here tonight lost, and you've convicted them of their sin. Lord, I know it wasn't a salvation message, but, Lord, if you're dealing with them about their sin, they can get saved. And so, Father, I pray they'd come, give their heart and life to Jesus. Lord, we'll take a Bible, show them how to be saved. Lord, there may be somebody here tonight saved, but they've gotten so far from God because they've let Ishmael control them. God, I pray tonight they do business with God. God, there may be somebody here tonight who just need to come and bless your name and praise you and thank you on the old-fashioned altar. Lord, whatever the need is tonight, help people to do business with God. Get glory to your wonderful name. And we'll bless you for it. Speak to hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.